There's a big debate about who is God. In fact, if you ask 10 different people about God, you hear 10 different opinions. And it's not about whether you're right or I'm right or he's right or she's right. It doesn't matter who's right or wrong. I think what is most pressing in today's uh, society is have you experienced God? And what's it like to experience Him? That's why in this series, Check Him Out, we're looking at three things. I would call it nothing, something, everything. Did you hear me? Nothing, something, everything. So it, it, I could tell you something that at first it looks like nothing, but really it is something that has everything to do with your future, with your happiness, with your stability, with who you are, with how you perceive the world and make a difference. We're going to talk about God. Instead of talking in a debate format, you're right, I'm right, I want you to check them out for yourself. Experience God. Check Him out. Welcome. We are so glad that you've come to the Check Him Out series with Jose Rojas. We're here in Eugene, Oregon, and I'm Pastor Dave McCoy, one of the local Eugene pastors. I know that you're going to be touched by the message of Jose Rojas. And also this evening, we have Vonda Bierman with us, who is a very talented Angel Award winner in Christian music. She is working, sponsored by the Quiet Hour Television Ministry. And she has what they say, the sweetest voice in Christian music today. And so we're going to be blessed by her musical ministry. Born into this world of sin, Goodness stops where I begin. I'm nothing on my own. And though I try so to be good, yet I know I never could deserve the love you've shown. To pay the debt I could not pay You gave me your life for mine What love divine That you would take my sin And even call and give me your life for mine. By your stripes I have been healed, and through your death my life was sealed. You gave It seems I've imagined him all of my life to have been the wisest of all of mankind. But if God's holy wisdom seems foolish to man, he must have seemed out of his mind. I mean, even his family said he was mad. The priest said the demons to blame. God, in the form of this strange young man, could not have been perfectly sane. We, in our foolishness, thought we were wise. 
he played the fool and he opened our eyes. When we in our weakness believed we were strong, he became helpless to show we were wrong. So we follow God's own fool. And only the foolish can tell. Believe beyond believable. Come, be a fool as well. So lay down your life for a carpenter's son, for a man there who died for a dream, for the power of paradox opens our eyes and blinds those who say they can see. We in our foolishness, we thought we were wise. He played the fool and he opened our eyes. When we in our weakness believed we were strong, he became helpless to show we were wrong. So we follow God's own fool, and only the foolish can tell. Believe. Believe beyond believable. Come, be a fool as well. Let's bow our heads together and pray. Lead us as we study some foolishness, O oh Lord. Foolishness to those who doubt the presence of a God, a stumbling block for others who are opinionated about God. But to those of us who have experienced Jesus, he is the power of God to save all of us to the uttermost, so we would see Jesus. Talk to us. In his name we ask. Amen. For many years now, studies have confirmed that human beings need relationships. Uh, psychologists learned this when they separated a monkey, a newborn babe, uh, baby monkey, from its mother put that monkey in a cage where a mother cannot touch that little monkey. As the time passed and that monkey longed to be held and nurtured, the monkey would not develop normally. Pretty soon, the little animal would be rocking in his cage, showing other telltale signs of disconnect and antisocial behavior. As time went on, this little monkey would literally be destroyed psychologically. Other monkeys that were kept with their mom so she can hold them, feed them, play with them, keep them clean of fleas and other things to eat, because they always find it, then they eat it. Kind of gross, but that's what it hap how it happens, you know. I'm only reporting to you the facts as I have seen them. It is recorded in the literature. The little monkey also gets to go out and play with other little monkeys. Well, from there, these researchers confirm beyond the shadow of any doubt, pretty much 99% of anyone who's studied anything will confirm to you that human beings need relationships. If you don't have the love of a parent, you figured it out. You found somebody who was like a mom to you, like a dad to you. You, 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 you filled the void, and if you didn't, you're a devastated human being. And we meet people like that from time to time who were virtually destroyed by the lack of relationships in their lives. We all need to be loved. We all need friends, you know, like, you know, like, you know, like my kids, everything is liked. So like, I was like, and then she was like, then they were like, and I was like, whatever. It's a very likable generation. <laughs> if you ever want to punish your kid, you take away their cell phone. No, I'll bring the belt. Hit me, do something, but don't take my cell phone. Why? Any young person, and I'm talking from three years old on up. <laughs> no, not quite that young, but although some have been reported. They don't talk on the phone anymore. They text. How many of you know what texting is? How many do not know what texting is? 
Thank you. How many don't care? <laughs> Just so that you know, 99% of young people are texting to each other. On my cell phone bill, where I have three teenagers at home, I'm, the fourth one is not quite there. She's well on her way. She's what's called a tween. You can read about that later. They, they had this many minutes of telephone conversations on their cell phone, but 3,000 texts each. I don't know how many texts I don't know how many texts that is per day. That means all day long. So what are you guys doing? Class. Outside. Then the, the little colon with the parentheses for smile. That meant yeah. Cool. They'll do this all day. And as I noticed the 4 a.m. text, all night long too. So when one of my kids gets in trouble, all right. Where's my cell phone? Papi, please. It's mine for two days. And those two days seem like two years for this poor child. Relationships. Relationships, we all need them. On the streets, it's the same way. As I drove through um, Brisbane, Australia last week, I was in a car with a colleague, and as we were driving along, I said, you guys have three gangs within this two-mile radius right here in the city. What gangs? We're an upscale community. And that's not what I read on your walls. They mark them just like wolves do, you know. And so I took him back. I said, take me back there. See, look, at here's a name, here's a name, and here's the name of their gang. See that number? Those are the drugs they sell. So when you see a 13, what's the 13th letter of the alphabet? M. What starts with M? Marijuana. So when you see a 13 on your wall, in your town, in your village, on the oak tree, that's what's being sold within that vicinity. Like it or not. You know how I can tell? Because they wrote it there. And it's amazing. When kids... That are, that are at risk behavior, find friends on the streets, they become the people you're afraid of. They're the ones you see on the news, but they're seeking for relationships, and if they can't find them at home, if they can't find them at school, if they can't find them at a church or a synagogue, they will go to the streets. Whoever will love me, that's where I'll go. Too many communities say, we love you if you do this, this, this. If not, we'll banish you. You don't quite say it that way. You just act that way. Christians are no different. You know, you know who can kill a Latino kid the best and the quickest? Another Latino kid. You know who kills black kids the most? Other black kids. You know who kills white kids the most? Other white kids. You know who kills Asian kids the most? You got the picture? You know who kills Christians the most? Other Christians. So we all can fail at this relationship thing, but it doesn't change the need of the victim who receives the beating. If you don't love me, I'm going to find someone else who does. So when we got to Sydney by last Sunday, I was riding with another colleague, and I said, dude, 11 gangs from the airport to here. You guys are busy. I see at least four different drugs. I got crack cocaine. That's 209. I got 13 going on on this part of town. And you know, you know how they, you, they, they mark where they sell? You, have you ever seen those, those running shoes, those tennis shoes hanging from the telephone line? Didn't you ever notice they're nice shoes? Didn't you wish you could get up there and cut them down so you could use them? $130 shoes are sitting up there. They look beautiful. That's a point. That is a point of sale. That's why they're there. Or it's a boundary between one gang and the next. People die in the vicinity of those shoes. So when you see those shoes, I'm talking street. You know why? Because that's where I was raised. I'm from the neighborhood, not the residential district big difference and so 
relationships when people find them they write them on the walls and then that's called tagging graffiti by uh, more uh, uh, formal standards but it's tagging a gang will tag your walls the wall of your fence on your house oh, I've had my car tagged I've, uh, all kinds of groups will tag then there are individuals who don't have relationships they tag the wall also uh, like this kid when he tagged the walls of Washington DC is because he did not have a gang uh, his name is skew s if you can read it carefully s k e w see skew he's quite skewed in his thinking but he's the coolest guy and, and uh, he started uh, coming to church and he met Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. So he dedicated catastrophic props for El Pastor Rojas, which I thought was very moving to have written in my Bible. <laughs> I do have my favorite Bible verses other places, but still, I have lone taggers and gang taggers who have graffitied my Bible. I collect these because I'm, I'm serious about relationships. If God does not reject us, then we should not reject each other. These are heroin addicts. As they got help for their addictions, they asked me to come to the treatment center itself. And we, we studied the Word of God there together. And 17 of these young men said, will you please baptize us? They brought a swimming pool into the foyer of a treatment center. Had that thing burst, we would have owed a lot of money. We would have owed a lot of money to that county. Relationships. You see them on the wall. You may go and do graffiti removal projects, but the kids on the street put out the word, they're cleaning our chalkboard. By tonight, we can write on a clean slate. <laughs> it's quite exciting. I mean, we got 20-year-old stuff up there. Clean it up for us so we can now tonight come and do some serious artwork on a nicely, freshly painted wall. So I'm just telling you how the other side of the fence thinks. Why? Because they're looking for relationships. And if you do not love somebody, they'll find someone else to love them. If you do not love your children, your children will find someone else to love them relationships are what we are made of and if we are lacking relationships we'll go find them wherever we can well you know this thing about uh, writing on walls began with god i don't know if you knew that that god invented graffiti doesn't that give you a chill down your spine now i know with some of you others who are viewing this program who live far away from the city we have no such blight in our community there is no graffiti, there's nothing but oak trees and tall pines. Yes, carved into the bark of that birch tree, Jeff plus Sue forever. And they carved a heart and an arrow with little drops of blood coming out. And the tree's dying, the tree is dying because everybody's carving on it. Everybody does it. Come on, you did it too. Nobody found out. Others tattoo it. You know, Debbie, Jennifer, Wilma. They're all crossed out, and he put the latest one, you know. <laughs> Don't look at each other. Some of them are kind of stretched now. They're a few decades old. But you would write about your relationships, whether it worked out or not, it became secondary. You were so proud of your relationship, you would write it. Well, God was the first to do that. He was leading Israel out of Egypt, and when they got to the wilderness, he calls Moses up onto the mountain, the leader of Israel. And in Exodus chapter 20, we are told that Jesus, uh, that God appears to Moses on the mountain and he does the, the most strangest thing. Because when God writes graffiti, he doesn't use spray paint. He doesn't use these expensive markers from Michael's, you know, the store. 1798. Nope. When God writes, 
he uses his own finger. That way there's no doubt about who wrote it. God starts writing on the wall of a mountain. He writes 10 commandments. Moses is like, whoa, I haven't seen this since Cairo. Somebody writing on the walls. God is writing on the wall. And the first thing he writes, you know, some people mistakenly have thought that when God wrote these Ten Commandments on the wall, that they were ten rules that if you do not keep them, you will die. How do you like that for a loving God? He'll kill you. Amen. I grew up very afraid of God. I don't, know, I, I don't know what Christian it was who gave me the mistaken notion that I'm going straight to hell because of those Ten Commandments. The first one was, please don't have other gods. I want to be your only one. Then the second one, he says, don't make any statues. You don't need statues when you have me. The third commandment is, don't take my name in vain. Today, even cursing and swearing includes the name of God. Are you aware that when an angel in heaven pronounces the name the Lord God Almighty, the angel literally veils themselves with their wings and say that name with reverence? Today, we use it in jokes and comedy and in cursing and swearing and hoping somebody dies. We, we use the name of God like some cheap something. God saying, respect me and respect my name. And then the fourth commandment, God says, I've blessed a day to, to, to I, I've blessed this day. Join me in that blessing. Worship me on that day. He said, it's Shabbat, the Sabbath day. Join me on that day. He's inviting us. He's, he's not saying, I'll cook you if you don't. Shabbat. <laughs> He's saying, I've made it holy. You've got the whole week with all kinds of stuff and work and stress. And it, but on the seventh day, join me in the blessing of this day. So you see those first four commandments about relationship with who? God. I don't see him threatening anybody yet. Then the fifth commandment, he says, honor your father and your mother. And Jesus, when he quoted it later, was to say that was the first commandment that contained a promise. Honor your father and your mother. Your days will be long upon the land which the Lord your God gave you. Respect your parents. Does that mean you have to agree with everything? I don't think so. My dad is from 1930, a while back. He thinks a little differently than me. I'm from 19, a while back. <laughs> Some of your older folks, all oh, these young whippersnappers who think they're old. And we think differently. My father knows that as a grown man with my own children, it's not about obeying the way I did when I was seven years old. It's about respecting him and honoring him because he is my father. I'm blessed. I still have them. I still have my mom. I must honor them. It's not about agreeing or disagreeing. Honor them. I see no threat. God is promising a blessing if we honor our parents. Even an unworthy parent who is abusive, honor them anyway. Even if you can't do what they do, honor them. God's promising a blessing. Then God says, don't kill. I think that one's self-explanatory. Homicide isn't fun. As a, a homicide family, when a member of my family is murdered and every single case has been closed for lack of evidence, no one has ever gone to jail for killing my family. And I really resonate when God says, don't kill anybody. I wish they would have read that before killing my loved one. You follow what I'm saying? It's not a rule. It's something deeper. This is don't steal. If it's not yours, leave it alone. If you don't understand, there's a police officer that explain it, 
and a, and a judge will ask you, do you have anything to say before I render sentencing? Stealing is something that's humanly understood. It's not just a divine idea. It's, it's an acceptable concept in any civilized society. You take what's not yours, your relationship is broken. And it says, don't commit adultery. If you have someone in your life, don't take somebody else. You already have a relationship. Don't break the one you have for another. Don't go too early into something without a commitment. Any counselor will tell you that sexual dysfunction comes when things are knocked out of whack. Not because a commandment says it's wrong, but because God understands who he created. If our relationships are in order, so is our psychological makeup. And you don't need a law of God to understand that if you commit adultery, the devastation on two homes and sets of children and lives... And, and, and those of you who've been through it, understand me. But that's why we talked about last night. Though your sins be as scarlet, God says, think this through. He says, let's reason together. Your, if your sins are really bad, what does God say? They shall be white as snow. God forgives sin, you see? So even if you messed up, get back up. He wants to bless you. Don't covet, you know, it, everything begins with coveting, killing, stealing, committing adultery. All those things we just mentioned start with, why does he have that? That iPod would look better on my dresser. You know, that car stereo, I've had 12 car stereos stolen. I've had 21 cars stolen. Because I used to do gang intervention. And I've had uh, my front door kicked in. And all my valuables, they only left the couches and the refrigerator because they were too heavy to grab. And so I've come home to an empty house, and then I got a wolf. <laughs> he, he didn't bark. But when, when he was happy, <laughs> and he'd stand up on my six-foot fence when kids would come back to steal. What? You want to come into my yard? I'm hungry. You look like pepperoni pizza. <laughs> As a victim of constant theft in my life, as someone who's been shot at many times, happy to report they missed, I've learned to run. <laughs> These commandments make a lot of sense. God says, you don't need anything that's not yours. I'll give you what you need and nothing else. But why does my neighbor have more stuff than me? Leave him alone. You still got more stuff than the other neighbor too. If I had a push mower like that, I'd be happy. Your push mower disappeared, didn't it? <laughs> my dad has a Ford tractor, but everyone left it alone. He lived in a John Deere community. God then took these Ten Commandments. Guess what he did? He cut them out into two tablets of stone. You take this graffiti down to my people, Israel, that they may know that I am their God and they are my people. What was it about? Relationship. God is telling his people, I love you guys. <laughs> I, love, I love you. For our daughters, we say, mija. For our sons, we say, mijo, I love you, mija. Check it out, mijo, I love you. Mm -mm. You see, God loves us. That's why he gave us Ten Commandments. They're just a description. The first four of a description of what it looks like to relate to God. The last six are a description of what it looks like to relate to people made in the image of God. God does graffiti, and just like the graffiti on the streets, what's it about? A relationship. Now, something else happens uh, on the street. You'll see a, a tag that's been crossed out. You know, a black-lettered uh, tag with blue paint. Somebody writes over them. You have no idea what that does on the street. That is a declaration of war. People are going to die for that. 
because it could be $150,000 worth of drug sales that, that's going to be the difference who's going to sell in this community. You don't go cross out my tent. You mess with me. You mess with your life. You turn on your TV. There was a shooting, three juveniles. And what you don't know is that that began with a kid crossing out the graffiti of the other two. You follow? So when you see stuff on the walls, it could also be a lack of a relationship. In the book of Daniel, chapter 5, we have another interesting story. There was a king, Belshazzar, who his father had been Nebuchadnezzar, a great king who gave his life to the Lord, a pagan king who came to accept the God of Israel. And so what was exciting about this story is, is that when you get to the point where, where Nebuchadnezzar finally accepts God, he shares him with the entire nation. An entire nation is blessed because Nebuchadnezzar became even greater than he had been before. But after he died, his son said, well, that was my dad's church. And he called for a party. I, I, I've buried 23 young people in my life. All of them were healthy. They, they would not have any sickness of any kind. All of them died violently. Some were killed with baseball bats. Others were stabbed. One was stabbed, and they put him on the street and drove the car over his head. He had a tire track on his face, and they left the casket open. I've, I've, I've seen atrocities in the lives of young people. Now, all 22 cases started at a party. The party life has grown. Research continues to confirm. Now, I'm not out to lay guilt. I just want to give you some information you can make wise decisions with. Binge drinking continues to be on the rise. A young person doesn't go out for a beer. They go out for 20 beers. And then they have contests at the fraternity, you know, at the frat house or something, and suddenly the, the more stuff is consumed. And then you have this gone wild culture that's arisen among us. And young people know exactly what I'm talking about. The grandma and grandpa are like, I'll ask the kids when I get home. I need to get to the bottom of this. The gone wild culture is blatant. It has led now to the rise of, of antibiotic-resistant gonorrheas and syphilis. We have, we have venereal diseases now that d defy description. AIDS continues to spread wildly. And, and, and it's not about what's sinful or wrong. You must use your reasoning. Since this is the age of reasoning, when everybody wants to know the data, just know that lives are being destroyed. And when a girl comes to talk to my wife, because I refer all of them to my wife, I talk to guys and she's agreed to talk to the girls. And when she comes to say, I'm pregnant, it was at a party, I don't even know what happened. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you've been through this experience, you know how painful. You were cool for a while, but the cool is gone. Now you just feel cold and lonely and used and broken. You feel like nothing. I have good news for you. God loves you. And he has plans for you. Not to harm you, but to prosper you, we are told in the book of Jeremiah. This... This king, this young king, got crazy, and he, called, he had a party. And then they brought the vessels from the temple of, of Solomon in Jerusalem, and they put strong drink into the vessels, and they said, Hail to the gods of Babylon, of wood, of stone, of silver, and gold. And suddenly, on the palace wall, a hand appeared, writing with its finger. And like good graffiti, no one could read it. No one could read what was on the wall. A finger had written it. And the king said, I'll make prime minister of whoever reads it. I can't read that. But Daniel, elderly now, the former prime minister, a man of God who worked for Nebuchadnezzar, he knew how to read graffiti. They had him brought in, oh, oh, oh. 
Oh, what does it say? Mene, mene, tekolu farsin. Yeah, what does it mean? Ah, mene, mene, mene. Oh, king, live forever. Mene, mene. Tekel. Tell me. God's been trying to reach you, but you insist on ignoring him. Tekel, you've been weighed in the balances. You have chosen to be wanting. Hufarsin, your kingdom will be given to the Medes and the Persians. You gave it away, not God. You see, God wants to live in us, to bless us and protect us. But if we turn away from God, we brought it upon ourselves. It's not God punishing us. It's we walking away from him. And that night, the king was killed. The Medes and Persians stopped the river, came under the walls because everybody was drunk. And on a huge party night, the great, great kingdom of Babylon was fallen. Once again, it was graffiti that God wrote on the wall. What was it about? The lack of a relationship. In John chapter 8, does this make sense to you? Or have I completely gone crazy? Both. Okay, I heard that. Okay. In John chapter 8, we are told another story. Jesus spent the night in prayer on the Mount of Olives. In which garden? What was his favorite place? Gethsemane. Do you have your spot to pray? When I was in college, I was always embarrassed. I don't want to see nobody, you know, like, you know. It's like, you know, like, you know, so like, like, you know, like, you know. So I'd find my little corner, and I'd go talk to him. Okay, Lord, I'm going in for this test. My last one was an F. The one before that was an F. Can we do something here? <laughs> so I went in and got a D. <laughs> I did better. It took me a while to learn how to study. It took me a while. But I finally learned. Brain tissue does kick in, you guys. Whoever's registered at the college or university, you hang in there. Whoever's registered at the academy, the, the high school, you hang in there. I notice you have a brain. It's between your ears. Go to the mirror and look. <gasps> it's in here. <gasps> Whoa! Discovery night. Neurofunction is possible. Now I read quantum physics for pleasure. Now that is bizarre. Now I need help from the other extreme. I'm also a herpetologist. I specialize in venom toxicology. And I used to train physicians on patient management after rattlesnake bite because I, I learned how to... Uh, anyway, I'm sure you really care about any of this. It all began with my special spot to pray that God blessed me in. Jesus prayed at Gethsemane every time he could. Took his guys up there and he would pray the whole night. Before he knew it, the sun had risen. You can have a relationship with God that is so real. You will not be a fanatic. You will not be a freak. In fact, you will make more sense to more people when you walk to God. And you walk with him, he will shine through you. You will become contagious. Anyway, Jesus comes into Jerusalem and he stands on the steps of the temple. He didn't go into church because not everybody's allowed in there. He stood outside the church on the steps and he just started talking to his 12 guys. The market was forming over there and finally someone said, look, something's going on down at the temple. I'm going to go check it out. <laughs> Sounds like Eugene, huh? Something's going down at the fairgrounds. People showed up, and when they would hear him, oh, I want to hear this. Soldiers had been sent to arrest him. Wait, wait, let's wait for the program to end, and then we'll take him into custody. And during the wait, oh, I didn't know that. Shh, wait, I want to hear this. And when he'd be finished preaching, I cannot arrest this. Never speak any man like this man speaks. You go arrest him. Nobody could even bust this guy. Because Jesus was so relevant he was so real. He was not a freak. When you get to know him, when you check him out for yourself, you find out that he's the best thing that could ever happen. Yeshua. 
really is Hamashiach. Jesus is the Messiah. Well, as he's speaking, there's a noise coming from this side, about 10, 15 priests. They have a girl. No, they were not escorting her to the meetings. They would throw her. <laughs> They'd pick her up again. <laughs> they just kept throwing this kid. Most chronologists suggest she was probably between 14, 15 years old. And finally, <laughs> she slid into Jesus' sandals. She was bleeding. She was profoundly ashamed. And the leader said, this girl was caught in the very act of sin. The law says that such should be stoned. What do you say, Jesus? And they, you know, in front of all these people that had gathered, if Jesus says, look at her, poor thing, have mercy, they'd say, aha, he's teaching you to disobey the law of Moses. And if Jesus would have said, well, it's true. The law does, sorry, sweetheart. Um, okay, take her out, but go far. Don't make noise because we're having a meeting. Then they would have said, aha, only Pilate can send someone to their death. They had him either way. Even today, there's always somebody who thinks they're smarter than Jesus. You watch out with Yeshua. And finally, guess what Jesus did? <laughs> Pulls out his trusty finger. And he starts tagging on the ground. <laughs> Check it out. Now, he could have tagged on the wall. He was writing the sins of these religious leaders. Do you have sins? Don't answer. Just don't raise your hand, just your conscience. Who are we then to condemn another? Jesus wrote their sins. He could have written them on the wall and finished them off. But no, he wrote them on sand so that they can be See, when Jesus takes note of our sins, it's because he wants to erase them. Did you hear me? Somebody out there has been carrying this terrible guilt for a long time. I have good news for you. Jesus wants to forgive you of your sin. You have violated the law, you've hurt humanity, or you've hurt your relationship with God. You know what? He wants to forgive you. As he wrote, one of the leaders said, well, aren't you going to dignify us with an answer? And Jesus said, oh, I'm sorry. Whoever doesn't have any sin, go ahead and throw a rock. And every one of those leaders had a rock. The younger ones had rocks. This poor girl covers up, because these were the holy men of Israel. They were, if Jesus gave divine permission for them to throw a rock, She's going to die. So she covered up, waiting to feel. Have you, have you ever been hit by a rock? I have. Have you? Come on, we're in Oregon. There's a lot of rocks out there. Especially those of you who grew up on a farm. Rocks are what childhood was about. I remember, and of course, in the city, you get more sophisticated. We had BB guns and stuff that I got shot with. And my brother... What was it about? I just want to see what would happen. Well, let me show you what will happen. <laughs> and this girl expected to die, and, and Jesus just kept writing. And nobody, one of you younger men throw a rock. Oh, sir, you're, you're the ranking leader. You throw the rock. Do the honor. The girl's just covered up waiting to die. Meanwhile, Jesus kept writing. One leader came. He saw his name. Took offerings last week. No one noticed. I'm late for a board meeting. He disappeared. And Jesus kept writing. I think after two or three guys, the rest of them were, I don't know what he's writing, but I'm going to leave while the going's good. Suddenly in verse 12, Jesus stands up and he, he looks to this girl and he says, well, didn't anybody condemn you? Where, where, are, where are those who condemn you? And she uncovered her head and she... Well, there is nobody. They were here a minute ago. They're not here anymore. And Jesus 
looks at this girl caught in the act of sin and he says, neither do I condemn you. If you carry guilt tonight, God says to you, neither do I condemn you. Then he invites you. You don't have to keep living this way. You can grow from this. Go, sin no more. You see, once again, you see him writing. And, and what's it about? It's a relationship. And finally, finally, only one more verse. It's found in Hebrews chapter 8. Near the end of your Bibles, for those of you who are still learning about this incredible book, holy writings are pretty powerful things. You know, the Torah has withstood the test of time. It's the Word of God has been published in more languages and in more copies than anything else on the planet. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, God says... For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws. Remember what the law of God is? The first four are relationship with God. The last six are relationship with people made in His image. I will put my laws into their minds. That means we will learn them. And too many people, that's where they stop. I learned them. Obviously you haven't, so you will be lost. Learning is not enough. Taking the class marriage and family down here at the university and getting an A plus is not enough. Being a good spouse is where it really comes down to it. Doesn't matter what grade you got in the course, even if you got an F in marriage and family, you can still be a good husband, a good wife. It's not enough to just know something. You can also live it. I will put my laws into their mind but I will write them on their hearts. I will write them on their hearts. I'm excited. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me my people. God has written on mountains. He, he has written on palace walls. His, his son has written on the dust in front of the temple. He's written everywhere. But the ultimate place that God wants to write is on your heart. Because see, the heart is not the same as the mind. The heart thing is when you fall in love. Remember that first time you did it? Okay, here. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Remember when he or she took it? Thank you. I like you too. <laughs> Aren't you going to give me yours? No, I like you. I just need more time. And they kept your heart, and they walked away with their own. They now have two hearts. So since one was extra, they began to play with your heart. Hey, I like the way your heart bounces. <laughs> Wait. Don't be hard on me. Don't worry. I've done this for a long time. I know what I'm doing. And on one day, poof, here, I never liked you anyway. And they give you what's left. <laughs> Wake up. See, you know how to give your heart away. You've done it before. That's what we mean when you give your heart to the Lord. That means you fall in love with him. He becomes an experience, not just a list of teachings. You become somebody who understands something because you've experienced him. And how do you experience him? Well, the first thing, as we saw in the previous meeting, when he forgives you of your sins. This world may have knowledge. This world may have skill. You may know science. You may know physics. You may know biology, physiology, and many other ologies that are out there. But if you do not have a Savior, all you have is knowledge and no hope for a future. Each of these nights will review another layer of what it means to experience Him. He wants a relationship with you. And He's defined it through ten definitions called the Ten Commandments. 
But it's not what you thought it was. This list of rules is guaranteed to kill you. No, it's a list of definitions that, that describe what you look like when you're having a relationship with Him and with people made in His image. Does this make sense? I, I can go more theoretical. I can pull out more empirical data. But we'll do that further in the week. I have people sitting here tonight who are much smarter than me, and that's all right. I look forward to learning from you too. And remember this, that every time God is seen writing, it's about a relationship. So as he had this whole book written for us, what is it about? A relationship. He, he has a plan. He actually sees you in a special place with Him. Many of us spiritually are like that little monkey all by ourselves in the cage, rocking away, wishing we had somebody to love us. I want you to know that God wants to hold you close to His heart. This sounds like this for now, but as you come each night, as you watch these programs from your home, streaming through the internet, at your sanctuary, you're going to continue to learn what it means to experience Him. We need experiential Christians. I close with this remark. Mahatma Gandhi, one of the great leaders of the last century, who opened the doors of freedom for the largest democracy on planet Earth, he did it nonviolently. When the Viceroy of England told him, you think you can actually raise an army and drive us out? The mighty British Empire? He said, oh, no, 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 you're misunderstanding. You are going to leave, but you will leave as friends. A reporter standing by asked him, you're always quoting Jesus. Are you a Christian? And as a devout Hindu, Gandhi said, call me a Christian and you insult me. Call me Christ-like, and you honor me. Too many times a Christian has not held up the definition well for the world to see. We misbehave in the name of Christianity. And for that, I offer my most humble apology on behalf of my fellow Christians. Sometimes in the name of Jesus, we do some pretty silly things that frankly are embarrassing but we serve a very patient God as we learn the value of Christ-likeness. To just be a Christian means you have learned many things. To be Christ-like means you have a relationship that has led you to be more and more like Him. We will reflect His character. It has been prophesied. We will be more like Him because of a relationship. He offers that relationship to you. It's because of the price that he paid on a hill very far away. Think about that tonight. Perhaps tonight you can look heavenward and say, will you be my friend? Jesus, can I come to the day that I give my heart to you? Perhaps you came not expecting to be convicted by his Holy Spirit. But as I sing this song, I want you to ask yourself, Lord, are you calling me to be your friend as well? On a hill very far away stood an old rugged cross where the dearest suffered and died that I might live by his side. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross in its trophies at last I lay down 
I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. I will cherish the old rugged cross in its trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Hashem Yeshua HaMashiach. Blessed be the name of Jesus, the Messiah. The Messiah has come to save the house of Israel. And God sent his only son that you and I might receive forgiveness for our mistakes. He has given us a definition of a relationship that's understood in ten descriptions. Four of them to do directly with him and six to do with people made in his image. I invite you, experience that relationship with him. If you want to learn what it means to serve God, Jesus said, when you give the food to the hungry and clothe the naked, when you visit the sick person, when you go to the jails and visit the inmate, when you take a stranger into your home, that's what it means to serve me. When you do it unto others who you consider the least of society, that's what it means to do for me. Relating to God means we relate to each other. You see how the Ten Commandments are really an intertwined experience of God and humanity in our lives. Let us bow our heads. And let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the blessing of Ten Commandments that describe you and people made in your image. What a joy to have relationships on earth and relationships with you in heaven. That we can live a life that is so dynamic here on this planet that all the things we have learned will make sense because they are a life not just a thought. They're an expression of love, not of anger. Teach us. We want that experience in our lives. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace.